Let's check out this, this Oprah thing. Now, this came out this week. Everybody's criticizing Oprah. And it is because she had the segment talking about, the, you know, the black experience in America and promoting uh, almost like a caste system, which caste systems are in India. And I'm going to, I want to kind of read this quote, read some of the critique of it and give you guys my my perspective. So the thing was a uh, uncomfortable conversation with the black man joined uh, Oprah Winfrey for a two-part episode which included a segment invo inviting non-black viewers to ask difficult questions about racism and white privilege. Not all white people have power, said one guest. There's plenty of poor working class white people. Uh, obviously, this is true. There's tons of poor white people. I don't, right, like we would agree um, there's, there's poor white people and pe white people have challenges, right? White people have challenges. And we don't recognize the fact that there's a lot of white people that struggle, right? I, get, I, I don't know if we do or don't recognize. That's a very broad generalization that there are, that we don't recognize white people who struggle, right? I don't know if that's true, but this is his perspective. <clears throat> and it's a different struggle, as you mentioned, because they're not streaming upstream, let's call it, okay? They continued, I think if we're going to come together and really attack racism and the inequities that are in this country and are in this world, that's important to not group all white people. Now, this is an interesting quote, not to group all white people, which, I, again, I've said this before. I've, I've, I've multiple times talked about like broad generalizations are the epitome of ignorance. Right. And he's saying we shouldn't group all white people. Yet in his kind of critique, he's basically saying that all people who acknowledge white privilege think that there's no white people that struggle. Right. That's that's a broad generalization. Like that's a that's a broad generalization of the critique that you're trying to combat, right? That people who acknowledge these things don't acknowledge that there are white people who struggle, right? Did you guys catch that? So that's a th I think that's interesting. But but nevertheless, let's keep reading. Uh, Winfrey re re responded: There are white people who are not as powerful as the system of white people, the caste system that's been put in place. But they still, no matter where they are on the wrong or ladder of success, they still have their whiteness. The veteran broadcaster also said white people have a leg up. You still have your whiteness. That's what the term white privilege is. It means that whiteness still gives you an advantage no matter what. Pretty loose definition, right? And again, I'm not an advocate of like intersectionality as gospel truth or critical race theory as truth. Um, the critique here comes in the critique here comes in that Oprah Winfrey is one of the richest, I think the richest black woman in the world, one of the richest women in the world, right? Her net worth is $2.6 billion, according to, 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 uh, to Forbes. And of course, the, you know, the, the, the conservatives lost it with this, right? Um, they said, uh, this is some of the responses, and now why is Oprah, maybe the richest black woman in the world, trying to shame white people as privileged? Now, I don't understand how and why does white privilege or privilege of any sort have to be always correlated with shame. This doesn't make any sense to me, and this is always like the triggered response. It's like, ah, don't call me privilege. You're trying to shame me. Oh, what are you saying? Right? Billionaire Oprah is now shaming white people. The, the word shame keeps being attached to white privilege. I don't understand that personally. Um, billionaire Oprah is now shaming white people. Conservatives uh, said, I pray for the day that America becomes a nation where someone like Oprah will be able to become a billionaire. Senator said, Cruz called the discussion utter racist BS. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. So before you guys freak out in the comments, again, keep the comments peaceful. I love, love the block, ban, hide button, timeout button, all of that. Just, 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 just follow along with me for a second, okay? For a second. I'm going to break down what I think this is from both perspectives. I'm going to break down my perspective as a white male who is an immigrant refugee and what I think my ultimate privilege is. Now, she is talking about this book called The Caste System, and like kind of like a caste system of America. I, th I think that's an overcorrection, and I'll explain why. But before that, I want to introduce this concept to you guys. I've talked about it a little bit. I want everybody here to go study it, right? And it's this concept, and there's a really good TED Talk about survivorship bias. I want all you guys to go and study this term because that actually impacts a lot of the way we look at the world. The idea that Oprah Winfrey can't critique 
systems of iniquity, even though I, I don't know how much of her critique I agree with, but the fact that she can't critique it because she's successful, it's kind of silly. Wouldn't the person that's most successful have the freedom to critique based on her having to overcome certain struggles and maybe getting lucky and working hard? Wouldn't she have the right to do that considering she's one of the most successful people? Why dismiss, why dismiss her perspective instantly? Let's look at survivorship bias. Now, during World War II, during World War II, these planes were coming back shot up with bullet holes, right? Because they were pop, 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 shooting these planes and they're, uh, they're coming back and this is where all the bullet holes were, right? And the planes, and these, again, planes coming back. Now, there was a bunch of people studying the planes that came back and where they were trying to figure out where are these planes being shot up and where should we put more armor, more reinforced, more armor, right? Just follow me for a second. And they were saying, uh, well, based on these charts, we should put more armor where they're, their holes, right? And then there was a famous, famous statistician, I think his name is Abraham Wold, who said, no, you guys are missing it. You don't reinforce the planes that came back and put more armor there. You're only looking at the planes that survived. You have to think about the planes that didn't survive. And up comes this concept of survivorship bias. We only look at the planes that came back and we're trying to reinforce those planes as if the planes that didn't make it, we should be studying the planes that didn't make it. We should be looking at why those planes didn't make it. Where were they shot? Well, they were probably shot in the cockpit. The pilots was probably shot, right? So on and so forth. So survivorship bias is that we're always tend to looking at the motivational, hopeful survivor. Nobody get, gets paid to give speeches about how they failed in life. Right. Nobody, nobody. And that's why I try to do a good job of like doing things like Mistake Mondays and sharing my failures with you guys, because I think I've learned way more from failing than I have from winning. Right. So we tend to look at people who are successful and think that because Oprah made it or because Obama made it, that well, everybody can make it. But we're not understanding that we're looking at the survivors. We're looking at people that defied all of the odds. And I know some of you guys are like, wow, this is making sense. It is. So you, we can't look at race from the perspective that, well, if Obama can become president or if Oprah can be a billionaire, then what are black people complaining about? You're studying and paying attention to the ones who've made it. I'll give you some more examples of survivorship bias. They don't build uh, those, those, those cabin homes like they used to. Gosh, they just really had a great eye for architecture. They, they didn't build those homes like they used to anymore. Ugh. Have you heard that, right? What, 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 what are we saying? No, no, they, all the crappy homes fell apart and we figured out new ways to build better homes that'll last longer, right? Oh, they don't build cars like they used to. Oh, we used to have cars and uh, yeah, it's good. No, it's just, you're not looking at all the horrible cars that aren't around. You're only looking at the Impalas and, and, the, and the Cadillacs that are, lasted from the 60s and 70s. There's a bunch of cars that they made that didn't last. Oh, when I was a kid, uh, we'd, uh, we'd run around in the back seat of the, of the pickup with no seat belts and it didn't matter. We just we didn't have car seats. You stupid millennials with your stupid car seats. Just liberal snowflakes. <laughs> well, you're not looking at all the millions and millions of kids that died because they didn't have a car seat, because they didn't wear a seatbelt, or because their drunk uncle made a left turn and somebody fell out of the back of the freaking pickup truck. Right? This is survivorship bias. You're only studying the people who made it. You're only studying the people who made it. Um, so... We have to be careful when you can't, don't critique somebody because they're successful that they don't have a right to critique. That's stupid. If anybody has a right to critique and share their opinion on what they think the inequities are of, um, you know, our system or whatever, it should be somebody that's highly successful, right? Should it not be? If somebody's a billionaire, you know, sh should I not listen to Kanye about talking about the ills he had to overcome to get into the fashion industry, right? This man made a classic album, went to Paris and interned for free at Louis Vuitton, and then finally, decades later, got his situation with Adidas, got a situation with Gap. Now he's a multi-billionaire. Should I not listen to the person if I'm trying to figure out how to get into fashion, high fashion, right? Should I not listen to the person that 
you know, overcame that so he can give me the critique of what it takes and the bias attached to that, right? Should I not? Why would you not listen to Oprah? Right? Survivorship bias. Guys, this just, I promise you, I promise you, if you just look at this concept, it'll give you so much more empathy for people. So let's go back to this concept and let's look at what was what was actually said. Let's look at what she actually said. And then let's look at what the what people assumed she said, because they're two different things. She said, there are white people who are not as powerful as the system of white people, the caste system that's in that's been put in place. But they still, no matter where they are on the wrong or ladder of success, they still have their whiteness. That's what the term white privilege means. It means that whiteness gives you an advantage no matter what. So what does that mean, an advantage? Now, I have a lot of advantages, right? I was born in a communist Soviet Union, the communist Soviet Union, and I had the advantage of winning a lottery and coming to America, right? That's that's a that's an advantage I had over people that went to other countries, right? I, I had an advantage of being born with all four of my limbs, with all ten fingers and ten toes, with my brain functional, an able body, a sound mind. Didn't have a psychotic break and develop bipolar or schizophrenia or anything like that. Like I have my mind. I have my body, I'm a male, which gives me a certain degree of advantage over female. I know there's all debate about whether sex is a, you know, a social construct or biology. No, I have more testosterone. I can put on muscle easier, right? I'm bigger, I'm stronger than my wife is. I have a certain degree of advantage if I'm walking down, uh, going on a walk. Right now, if I go on a walk in the sunset, I have a privilege, right? I have an advantage over a woman. I have an advantage that I'm a male. I have advantages that I'm viewed as a white male. Now, what does that mean? That just means that on a very superficial level, when I'm pulled over by a police officer, I'm going to be viewed as less of a threat. If you want to make the argument for implicit bias or not, it is what it is. Like I, I think there's a, I get viewed as less of a threat. That doesn't mean that I should be ashamed of that. Now, when they check, grab my ID and they see my name and my name says Ruslan Karoglanov, my birthplace is Azerbaijan, Baku, right? It's kind of like, oh, well, he, what is that? He, 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 could, he could be a, a light-skinned Arab guy, right? Like, we don't, we don't know what this dude is. I have an RZ name. My last name, Karoglanov. That changed because of people having to, uh, trying to push us out of Azerbaijan. We have to take on Azerbaijanian name. We changed our Armenian last name to Azerbaijanian name. So I have a Muslim sounding last name. Do I have a degree of superficial privilege? Yes, I do. But I'll tell you what my ultimate privilege is. And I think this is where I'm gonna lose you guys on both sides, right? My ultimate privilege is that I'm an immigrant and I see opportunity completely different. I've seen Soviet communist Russia. I remember lining up for food rations. I remember my family getting a tub of water and having to make that work. I remember. My ultimate privilege is the fact that I'm an immigrant, right? And, and yes, I would agree that I have a degree of, I guess, white privilege, and I don't have a problem admitting that, but my ultimate privilege beyond a superficial level is my mentality, is my mindset, is the way I view the world gives me an outlook of opportunity. And if you look, again, some of you guys are gonna be triggered, regardless on what side, I guess I'm just trying to upset everybody today, but regardless on what side of you look at this, if you look at how immigrants from Ghana and Nigeria and Jamaica perform in compare, and they've done studies that's com com compared to white people, a lot of these immigrants outperform and out earn white people. It's crazy, right? So you also got to factor in, though, that they won a lottery to get here. So when we're bringing people over, we are bringing some of the smartest and the brightest and the right, the, the most efficient. And with refugees, we're, we're not. Like, refugees are just coming over as like, gosh, we just don't want to die. America will take us in. So we all have different sets of advantages and disadvantages. The, the superficial that the majority of this country, the majority of this country, the majority of people in power are white, and to say that, hey, you are going to view your own as less of a threat, whether implicitly or subconsciously or consciously. I don't understand why that's such a controversial concept. I don't understand why white people get so defensive and so combative about this concept, right? I don't think it's that big of a deal. The conservative response is goofy because when people say white privilege, nobody is saying white guilt. Nobody's telling you to feel guilty, right? 
You still have your rightness as the term white privilege, and then the responses are, and now why is Oprah, maybe the richest black woman in the world, trying to shame white people? Who said anything about shame? Who said anything about shame? I pray for the day that America becomes a nation where someone like Oprah be in. That's, that's actually a, a hilarious job. How did Oprah make $2.5 million uh, so racist? Um, but this idea that shame is instantly attributed to this concept, I, I just, what I think is, I think we're so sensitive. I think we're so sensitive. And I think it's such a time where there's disparities on multiple fronts that we just get triggered very easily and it's to me, it's not that big of a deal to be like, guys, I'm a white male in a country that's predominantly white on a superficial level. Of course, I'm going to be perceived more favorably. That doesn't mean that once I open my mouth, I can't make an ass of myself. <laughs> right. Right. Excuse my language. Some of you guys are going to freak out that I said that word. That doesn't mean that someone who's more educated and more qualified than me isn't going to get that job over me. It just means that on a superficial level. People view me as less of a threat because I'm white. That's why. Why are we? Why is that a thing? Why are we so combative and sensitive about this? You know what I'm saying? If you are born with all your limbs, if you're born with your sight, if you're born in America, you have privilege, right? You have privilege over somebody that's freaking born in communist China, where they just got rid of their one one child policy like four years ago. Absolutely, right? But we so sensitive that we equate any amount of privilege to instantly shame. Nobody's saying you have to be ashamed. They feel the way because they are ashamed that they have ignored the plight of others. Ooh, you going in now because they've ignored the plight of others their whole life and now it's being thrown in their face. That's what I see in the other white people around me. That's interesting. If you feel ashamed because you've been apathetic and you haven't cared about dis uh, disenfranchised groups, you haven't cared. Well, then that's an issue about you not about the concept, right? And again, it's not to say that I believe that, again, I'm not a, you know, critical race theory is absolute truth or intersectionality absolute truth, but there's some concepts there that I think are truthful and helpful, right? There are certain black people like my buddy Zuby, like my buddy LaVar Sierra, conservatives, black conservatives. And, you know, again, this is, I'm not, by the way, I'm not speaking for black people, but there are certain black people who would say, hey, yeah, the concept of white privilege doesn't help me. You're telling me I'm oppressed. I don't need to hear that. And I, I'm like, yeah, cool. You're, if, you, if you don't think that's helpful, that's fine. I'm not asking anybody to advocate or not advocate. I'm asking us to not be triggered when these things are brought up because I just don't, I don't see it as that combative of a thing. I do think that Oprah's view and perpetuating this caste system thing, I think this is an overcorrection. If you look at India's actual caste system, it's a hundred times worse than what it is here in America. It's way worse, right? And you don't just get to jump up the economic ladder. It's way worse. So to say that we have a caste system, again, I think that's an overcorrection. I think that's an overcorrection. What is that? Overcorrections happen all the time, right? People are apathetic towards racism. So we say, well, nah, you're compliant and you're, ra you're, you're covertly racist. You're an asymptomatic racist. People are homophobic. They treat gay people bad. So then any critique of anybody's sexuality all of a sudden is you know deplorable and you can't even say ah, i don't know if we should be giving children puberty blockers and uh letting you know six and seven year olds tell us their gender i don't know if that's helpful right what is that that's an overcorrection right that's an overcorrection. and i'm not equating that to oprah necessarily but i'm just saying we overcorrect all the time we overcorrect all the time and it, it, it happens all the time unfortunately those are my thoughts and i think it's important for us just to listen and just to have empathy try to understand